as part of our ongoing series about modern teams tackling modern problems. So excited today to talk with three innovative leaders who are developing a digital education platform designed both for their communities and for the concept of community as a whole. Uh, for me, there's not a more compelling or challenging modern problem than education, especially as we've learned so much about online learning throughout the pandemic. But I would describe the leaders we get to learn from today as undaunted by this modern challenge. And seeing the three of them and their broader teams in action really brings to me the vision of a modern team. Two of those leaders are with the United Negro College Fund, UNCF, their Director of Strategy, Julian Thompson, and their VP of Strategic Partnerships and Institutional Programs, Ed Smith-Lewis. And we also get to talk today with one of my teammates, Deloitte Consulting uh, Leader Julius Tapper. Julius is the head of inclusive innovation for Ethos, our purpose-driven innovation offering. Great to have all of you. I'm going to start with Julian. Julian, maybe set the stage and share a brief history of UNCF and set the stage for the role it's played with historically Black colleges and universities. Sure. Happy to do so, Dan, and it's a pleasure to be on this call in 1943, in the Pittsburgh Courier, Frederick D. Patterson, who was at the time the president of Tuskegee Institute, wrote an article on the need for a national movement to support historically Black colleges and universities. At that point, HBCUs were educating over 90% of the country's Black students. And while the public institutions had resources from their public legislatures and governments, the private HBCUs like Morehouse College, Spelman College, Tuskegee University, where Frederick T. Patterson came from, and many others really didn't have the resources they need to support the students and the communities um, that they intended to serve. And so in 1944, Frederick T. Patterson, along with Mary McLeod Bethune and other leaders, founded the United Negro College Fund. For the last 78 years, UNCF has focused its work on two anchor goals. The first is to provide funding and other resources to historically Black colleges. And the second has been to make sure that there are a sufficient number of scholarships for the first-generation low-income students that HBCUs primarily serve. And so that's been the real marker of success for UNCF and why we believe a mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. Ed and I end up our uh, work for a third part of UNCF called the Institute for Capacity Building. And our work is really focused on the question of institutional improvement and transformation, ensuring that HBCUs have the people, the processes, and the technology they need to survive and thrive in the 21st century. Well, amazing description. and. Uh, you have that rich history. And then I would have to imagine, Julian, your and Ed's job got a lot more interesting in ways you never would have imagined given your mission as a pandemic arrived. And for this series with Wired, we've been discussing across a bunch of sectors and a bunch of topics, modern new age problems that businesses and institutions are experiencing and the need for the solutions that uh, approach those challenges to be just as modern and just as innovative. So. There's a pandemic um, and UNCF has the responsibility and the opportunity to help HBCUs with creating virtual educational opportunities when you know, people are separate more than ever. I'd love to just hear how you identified the core challenge and how you approached it. And specifically, Julian, what you might think, how you approached it differently given the uniqueness of the circumstance. Yeah, it's a great question, and um, it's one that we really thought carefully about as students of HBCUs at UNCF. Um, I say students of HBCUs because we really think carefully about the HBCU business model. It's a model that has worked successfully for over 175 years to support students that are not well served by other parts of the higher education system, right? And so when we thought about sort of engaging those groups of institutions, we think very carefully about how they create their organizational structures, about the methods they use for professional development and innovation, um, about their embrace of technology, because they're always positioned to engage students 
um, that really need the opportunity to use higher education to propel their individual success and social economic mobility. When the pandemic hit, we realized that we would have to engage HBCUs in a new way to be able to respond to the challenge of education online. Before the pandemic, just about 55% of higher education institutions had online degree programs, and that compared to about 25% of HBCUs. Some of that was because of resource constraints and HBCUs not having some of the endowments and annual operating budgets that you otherwise anticipate in higher education. But the other part was because HBCUs have a high touch, high engagement model, right? They help first generation low income students succeed because of the method of uh, community building that they infuse with their approach to higher education. And so as we moved into the pandemic, our first step was to really think carefully about enabling HBCUs to be able to use the existing tools and resources available in higher education to be able to engage their students online. But as we thought more long term, the fundamental question we asked ourselves was, there's a special sauce about how HBCUs operate and about how they've always operated. What could we do to take those elements, those assets, those methods of being, and translate them, reimagine them for the online context? It was exciting to be able to crystallize that. We actually crystallized some of those ideas before the pandemic because we knew that this was the direction higher education was going. But once the pandemic hit, and then really, Dan, once the country started to experience the racial reckoning in 2020 that, that caused the awareness that the country needed to move forward, to think differently, to take new um, risks, to be able to innovate um, and, and move things forward, we started to be able to build the momentum for what we now call HBCUV, uh, which is our aspiration to reimagine higher education online um, in the spirit of how HBCUs operate. Brilliantly said, Julian. And I love the concept of extending, preserving the special sauce as you virtualize and digitize. And it's in so many of these problems and situations we talk about, wh whether you're talking about something um, like HBCUs or you're talking about private sector enterprises, people lose special sauce and essence along the way of taking the digital transformation virtual journey. And I think the fact that you at the outset said, we actually need to name the special sauce and we need to figure out how to make sure it lives in the future. That's magic. It was really exciting to be able to sort of position that at the center of our innovation because we quickly realized that many of the other sort of uh, education technology tools in the market today focused either on other audiences and groups of students or communities, or were really faculty and administrator driven rather than being driven from the needs, dreams, aspirations of the students using those platforms. Um, we've been really excited through HBCUV to take the long and winding road that's needed to get real community and institutional feedback. Rather than drive this process at UNCF alone, we've welcomed nine institutions to join us on our innovation and discovery process. And that means that the elements, the core features of HBCUV that we now think will be a, a, a part of the platform moving forward, um, have been inspired by um, and recommended by the communities that we ultimately uh, wish to serve. Communities that oftentimes don't get a chance to participate in some of the innovative opportunities uh, that, that HBCUV now presents. Love it. All right, I wanna bring in Ed Smith-Lewis and Ed, uh, start, at, start at the end sort of coming out of the pandemic. What do you see as the unique position that HBCUs are in now? Um, not only coming out of the pandemic, but also out of the imperative that began, as Julian talked about, with the racial justice movement in uh, March 2020 and beyond. You know, I'm excited by the position HBCUs are in today, but I've been excited uh, about the position HBCUs have been in for a while now. Um, I think what 
what's more exciting this time around is that more people have that same understanding. Um, as Julian said, uh, there was a racial reckoning with the untimely murder of George Floyd. Uh, and I think with the world being on lockdown at a time where something so horrific could happen, it just opened up an aperture for people to say, hey, I might be missing something. And I think higher ed had that same reckoning where funders, support partners, I think realized that there was maybe some blind spots that we all have. And HBCUs have been a blind spot for higher education, dare I say society, really since their founding. I mean, higher education is an exclusive enterprise. It always has been. Um, and HBCUs were founded to educate a set of individuals who were excluded um, from that enterprise. And these institutions, these HBCUs, have been fighting that reputation for the last 150 years. But I think what the world realized is that uh, the demographics of the country have changed, uh, what the needs and the purpose uh, in terms of higher education, um, that has changed uh, in a way that I think HBCUs have an elevated position. The fact that they have enrolled successfully and excluded population since their founding is now sort of a model for the rest of higher ed. The growth in higher ed will come from low income and underrepresented students. I think HBCUs are in a much more elevated position than they, they've ever been, um, primarily because their model of education and who they educated um, is the future of higher education. When we think about demographic shifts, we know that future enrollment will come from low-income and underrepresented students, students that HBCUs have figured out how to punch above their weight. Now, HBCUs get torn down a lot because we have a 36, 37 percent on average graduation rate. When you look at Input adjusted outcomes for historically black colleges and universities, really taking into account the types of students we serve. First generation, 60% of our students are first generation. 75% of them are low income. We outperform to the tune of three to four times. You have a 9% chance of getting a bachelor's degree by the time you're 26. And so that 36% average graduation rate is actually a mark of success. Although when compared to institutions who enroll majority high income, majority multi-generation students were deemed as less than. And so when you ask me, how do I feel about HBCUs today? I feel like I felt yesterday, but I'm excited that more people are starting to realize that there's some value here and there's something to be learned. I, and I'm excited about too. And I, I'm really curious how you, as you think about, you know, your team and the work you're doing, how do you think about exporting that goodness to the broader world versus preserving it within the HBCU community? That's always tricky when you have really cool solutions to really important problems. How much time do you spend on thinking, how do I get this into the broader community? America is an interesting place because it's more about who you know and what they know about you than what you actually do. And I argue all the time with my team, we push our institutions to document and share as much as you can, as often as you can. Within our cohort of institutions, our community of practice, uh, we talk about the idea of stealing what works. Now, in grant applications, we write adopt and adapt. But the reality is, if it works over there for their students and you have the same student type, then why reinvent the wheel? Because if you think about our success as community success, rather than institutional success, you'll realize that you can go fast alone, but you can go further together. And that's how we approach this work. And so we fundamentally know that since their very founding, HBCUs have developed 
a sense of belonging, empowerment, encouragement, representation for students who were not invited to participate in education elsewhere. And that focus has evolved over time to really be a culturally empowering opportunity that still has real need for existence today. What do I mean by that? As what some might call an anomaly, uh, myself growing up in a, a public school system, I was always seen as special because I did well in class and I had high expectations for the quality of work that I submitted. But when I went to places where academic achievement was normalized, right, I was representative of a group that didn't look like me. Um, I had to hold the weight of being the sole African-American male in many of my high school classes at my private day school. When I went to Morehouse College, that weight was gone. Hmm. <laughs> the reality was I got to find myself on campus while I learned versus find myself while representing a whole community. And that's a lot of pressure um, for individuals to own representing an entire community, an entire race with every word they say, every move they make. And HBCUs remove that. And they remove that and allow you to, to serve that community. And that's what I think is so empowering about the Black college experience. And I can imagine what if every institution found a way to remove the burden of context, society, familial, and really just allow a student to learn to learn for the sake of learning, and to push them to leave those institutions to impart change. It's what HBCUs do. No matter what campus you go to, there's some type of mantra that says, come in to learn, depart to serve. And if every higher ed, over 6,000 higher ed institutions in this country, if they did that for every single individual that walked their campus, the world would be a better place. And so when I think about the secret sauce of HBCUs, uh, we are trying to expose that secret sauce right now. Uh, we're trying to expose it in a way that our institutions take ownership of what they do and they do it with intentionality, that we document it such that others can steal it. And most importantly, that we elevate it and reimagine it, as Julian said, because there's this thing called technology that also hasn't included us for a very long time. And what if we found a way to do it through tech? Now, we've talked about technology as a great equalizer. I think it's going to be a blend of leveraging technology, but driving with community that will achieve that uh, equal opportunity for all. Amazing, Ed. And as we've gone through this series, what you just shared about the positivity of stealing good ideas and the double entendre there is one of the most important insights. And I think modern teams who are coming up with great solutions, figuring out ways to have their solutions stolen by others for the benefit of the broader society is a really cool way to think about um, each of our responsibilities. I want to talk now to Julius Tapper. Julius uh, is a Deloitte leader. And Julius, as the leader of our Deloitte Digital Ethos team, formed a team that is about 90% racially and ethnically diverse, um, is more than 50% Black, has almost a third of its uh, team members are HBCU alumni. Julius, walk me through the process, the decision, the framing behind how you ended up with that team. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So the team that we've put together for the HBCUV project uh, represents in the same ways that HBCUs represent a certain magic and a certain secret sauce that have lessons for the entire education industry. I think the team that we've put together and the community and culture and relationships on that team represent some indications of secret sauce and magic for how work gets done. 
and for how we at Deloitte can bring together other teams. Um, so one of the fundamental beliefs of inclusive innovation, of equity-centered design, is that who designs matters, who participates in decision-making matters. And that had to be reflected on the team that was going to come into this environment and this opportunity to, to facilitate that design. And when we think about, again, as, as uh, Julian mentioned, really centering the community building, the culture, the history, the legacy, that magic of HBCUs in our design and innovation process, that had to be reflected in our team as well. And when we look at the makeup of the team, the diversity goes way beyond that. We have Eagle Scouts on the team. We have folks who are professional chefs in, in, in former lives. We have varsity athletes. We have singers. We have dancers. We have folks from you know many countries of origin. And if you know community and culture are some of the deepest human truths, and if everything that we do as humans on this earth is in some way relational, then creating the space for those relationships, cultivating an environment of community, recognizing that everything stems through culture, that's how you start to create the conditions for magic. That's how we start to, you know, allow some of the the kinetic energy um, yeah. of all of our busting lives come together. I love it. I, I love the harnessing of that kinetic energy for good. I also love the idea that um, most great modern former professional chefs in there <laughs> as, a, as a dimension of, uh, of diversity. Um, Julius, I, I love you, your career has been a, not only a successful one, but a fascinating one. And you've done work in finance and social investing and product development. Just how did the texture and the variety in your background help you on this particular project? For sure. And, and, you know, it's it started from childhood and it's just elements of imagination, of curiosity and of a desire to, you know, stumble away through sense making and wayfinding. So I studied economics. I studied French. I studied psychology. I studied English. I used to do, you know, fashion photography and all of those things might seem random or dissimilar, but they all center around a few core tenants that I bring with me in my career and the journey that that's taken and that I think is magic for for teams and, and problem solving. So it's it's you know economics and English and psychology are really about noticing and identifying and being able to describe and storytell systems and interactions and cause and effect. And you know French photography, you know those things are about about culture, about expression, about beauty. And, and those are, again, I think, related to human truths and system dynamics. And then when you bring that together, um, how it helps me is being able to try and see the system, understand what dynamics are either happening or could happen, and then facilitate the conditions or insert the right energy to let the reactions and the different bonds occur. Mm. So those are how some of the different uh, parts of my background kind of come together in what I think the urgent task for, for business, for innovation, for problem solving is about transdisciplinary dot connecting, is about systems um, of observation and intervention insightful and super interesting. So so we we then get this opportunity to address this wicked modern problem alongside our friends at UNCF and you're forming the team to accompany you to do that. How, how do you think about in 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 the team the ethos team overall that you're drawing from it has a group that probably is uncommonly aware of the HBCU experience and the challenges in higher education for um, Black and other minority low-income um, individuals. How important was that sort of pre-existing passion as you formed the team? And perhaps did you want to make sure there were people on the team who had none of that to make sure there was texture to the conversations that were happening and it wasn't an echo chamber? A thousand percent. Um, I, th I think, you know, this is a incredible opportunity and as we, as the theme of the of the series is a, a wicked problem 
and a, and a wicked challenge. And so it was going to absolutely take passion to get through, to both get to the idea and then get through the process of realizing it. And so passion had to be there um, and curiosity had to be there and room for serendipity and the unknown had to be there. So we needed the passion and the experience and the grounding of folks who had the HBCU experience. We needed the, the openness, the curiosity, the other energy from folks that didn't. And we needed a culture of connection, of sharing, and also of care and of commitment to each other uh, to, to, you know, to get, a, to get us there. And so that balance is important and really being attentive to the, the, the community culture uh, and the process is what's very important. So Julia's final question, H how has our Deloitte work together with UNCF inspired the way you will plan and execute work and build teams for the future that you'll do with other important clients? One practice and lesson that I will forever take with me and recommend to everyone is always start a Zoom meeting with music. As folks are gathering, as they're ready to kick off, as they're getting ready to start, you put on some Motown, you see what happens. <laughs> Opening that space for culture, for energy, for joy, for humanity, for expression, it does more than get the juices flowing for a brainstorm. It is absolute magic. Every project I do, every meeting I host, you better believe there's entrance music. I love it. And as you know, Julius, when I get our entire um, <laughs> tens of thousands of people together, I always have a guest DJ to start, <laughs> to start the show for that reason. And frankly, to expose as many people as you can to culture through music which I think is a super powerful um, thing. Uh, one closing question for Julian Thompson of, of UNCF, which is essentially the same version, a different version of the question I just asked Julius, which is in the future, as you're composing teams, both from within UNCF and you know, when building partnerships with people like us, how are you gonna think differently about team formation based on this great experience? Partnering with Deloitte and, and Ethos has been a real blessing for UNCF and for the institutions that we partner with. I think the points that Julius made about the diversity of the team that's come together has been really powerful for us. We operate in a space where we're always thinking about the vendors that are interacting, the vendors and providers that are interacting with our institutions. And so many of them have transactional relationships that form the core of the partnership. One of the reasons that we decided to go with Deloitte and with Ethos is because we got a sense from the very beginning that the spirit of their engagement went beyond transactional engagement. They talked to us about their uh, clear sort of priorities and diversity and inclusion and how that manifested in, how they're in their work. We learned about the thousands of HBCU graduates who found their way into Deloitte's um, employment and how that work has built over time to be able to ensure that their voices really matter. Uh, when we asked for presentations and proposals, we always knew that they came from um, a diverse perspective. Mm. And as we've gone through some of the challenges that come with building a whole brand new online learning platform, we've experienced, I think, the flexibility from Deloitte that indicates that they're a partner in it with us for the long haul. And so because of Deloitte, my tentacles are up now in a way that they haven't been before for the type of partnership that really demonstrates mm -hmm. in real time its commitment to long-term vision. And I want to make sure that as we move forward and as our institutions move forward, um, that we embrace partnerships that feel very much like the one we have the privilege of participating in um, with HBCUV. That was beautiful. and. Uh... I took a lot from that answer about um, the authenticity of how we show up and how much it matters and how much when we do it the right way, it's actually, it feels different in a good, in a good, in a good way. That's uh, absolutely right. And, you know, 
when we do this work, um, I always say to my team in the trenches, you know, um, we are side by side with people who are committing to a mission that um, existed before we got here and will exist after we leave. Um, so who you invite into the trenches to do this work with you matters. Um, it can accelerate work, but it can also really distract if you bring in the wrong people. And so being really well in tune with, with who those companies are that not only add value, but add spirit to the mission that put you in the place of working long hours or finding out ways to do things on the weekend or trying to make a dollar out of a dime, having those folks with you uh, makes a big difference. Well, thank you, Julian, Edward, and Julius for your time and the insights you shared today. I am beyond inspired by what I learned and I'm excited to see this new digital community for HBCUs grow and flourish in the coming months and years. Mm -hmm.